Hello, this is Davidy, and welcome to Lufia 2 A History. Lufia 2 is probably the best sequel to the worst game ever made. It's a classic, standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with other masterpieces such as Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, and Final Fantasy III. The developers obviously put a lot of love and care into the game, because just about everything from the first game is gone, improved upon, or changed for the better. Characters are no longer reduced to tropes and are actually fully realized with fleshed out development. Released in 1995 in Japan and 1996 in the West by Taito, it holds its own against the powerhouses released by Square around the same time, receiving a 30 out of 40 in Famitsu and a 90% in Game Fan Magazine. The game takes a page out of Final Fantasy IV's book in that you have a revolving cast of characters that join and leave your party at prescribed moments, all for different reasons. Maxim, the forefather of the hero from the first game, is your typical honorable protagonist. In battle, he's well-rounded as a strong attacker and competent healer. His girlfriend Tia is the weapon shop owner and her typical mage. She is the weakest attack in the game, but she can cast extremely powerful magic. She's sweet and lovable, and I find myself rooting for her, but I know that her romance is doomed. Guy is a fellow monster hunter and devoted to his sister. He's an extremely strong fighter, but unable to use any magic. Selen joins as the commander of the army of Parcelite, and she's a bit rough around the edges and fails to get along with the party at first, but it doesn't take long for her to grow to respect and eventually defend befriend the group. As the game progresses, she marries Maxim and becomes the mother of his child, and she'll be your main spellcaster for the second half of the game. Dakar is the self-proclaimed greatest warrior of the land. He's the most powerful attacker in the game, but he doesn't have much of a brain to back it up. He and Guy get into quite a few arguments over who is the more powerful warrior. Lexus Shia joins the party briefly, and he's just about as useful as you, ex as you would expect a scientist to be. As a caster, he's okay, and as an attacker, he's better than Tia, but at least he builds you a submarine. The last party member to join, Artea, is an elf, who apparently goes by Artie while he's in the menu screen. He's really good, able to cast all kinds of spells, and even some light-based spells that Selen can't use, and on top of that, his bows attack all enemies. The antagonists, while not as well fleshed out as their counterparts, are still well done for their time. The Sinistrals appear, hence the subtitle of the game, but for the most part they just serve as an excuse for a boss fight. Real development occurs in the form of Aram, the Sinistral of Death. I'm not going to spoil anything here, but there aren't just big baddies to deal with, there are smaller fry that your party encounters as well. The most memorable being Birdie and Bart, an extremely incompetent duo of thieves who even Dakar is able to outsmart. They kind of remind me of Liz and Arj from Wild Arms too, if any of you out there have ever played that gem. Lufia 2 is a prequel to Lufia, and as such, a bit of the ending was revealed in the opening of the first game. But the story is so well told with so many twists and turns that it doesn't matter if you already know the outcome before beginning the game. It also helps that Lufia didn't sell all that well, so the majority of the players, myself included, only played the first Lufia after having played and loved Lufia 2. It's a shame though, because after playing the masterpiece that's Lufia 2, I'm sure most people were disappointed by the first. The game opens with Maxim, resident swordsman for hire, living peacefully with his girlfriend Tia, the local shopkeeper in the small town of Elsif. Things all change one day when Iris walks into his life, and he learns about the dark appearance of the Sinistrals. The story has a sense of foreboding for anyone who has played the original, but overall, the adventure is lighthearted. Party members bicker over stupid things, like how much salt to put in a dish or who is the stronger warrior. A nice touch is watching the relationship between Maxim and Selen grow and blossom in the marriage. The only similar game that I can think of that does this is Dragon Quest V. But here it's a bit nicer because the characters are more fleshed out, though it would have been nice to be able to choose between Tia and Selen, but I can see why the developers wouldn't or couldn't go that route. The visuals are very nicely done and the soundtrack is whimsical. I love the overworld theme but there really should have been more dungeon tracks considering that you're stuck in there for about 75% of the game. Speaking of dungeons, while encounters in the overworld are random, those in the dungeons are on screen and each time you move or take an action, the monsters move as well. So you could fight all the monsters if you want or avoid them with careful movement. 
One thing that I think really ages many older games is their walking speed. They almost beg for a fast forward feature. You'll not have that problem in Lufia 2 though. Maxim speeds around like the flash and it's glorious. The dungeons are also chock full of devious puzzles from block pushing to lever pulling. They're really well done and the game does do a good job of spacing them out throughout the dungeon and giving you clues on how to solve them. Similar to Zelda, the party gains tools to use in order to solve puzzles such as fire arrows, bombs, and hook shots. Equally nice, if you screw up too much, you can just cast a spell to refresh it with no penalty. Another homage to Zelda is that typically there's a boss key you have to find in order to fight the boss and move on from the dungeon. The one gripe that I do have about the dungeon and the overworld is that there really is no illusion of non-linearity that other JRPGs seem to have mastered. It is quite literally town, dungeon, town, dungeon for about two-thirds of the game. The battle system is your standard turn-based affair, but with a slight twist, the IP system. This unique system, which I haven't seen copied in any subsequent games, is quite ingenious. For the most part, each piece of equipment has a unique ability attached to it, be it healing, attacking, or support. You can only use the abilities of those items you have equipped. Each ability takes up a certain percentage of your IP gauge, and the gauge only fills up as you take hits in battle. It's similar to a limit break system, but more strategic in that you have about five choices of what abilities to use, and you have to make strategic decisions about what you actually want to equip. Do you want to equip the powerful weapon that has no ability, or the weaker weapon with the kick-ass ability? I found myself changing equipment around because one character didn't have any good abilities, and I wanted to be able to put his IP attacks to good use. Another unique addition are the capsule monsters who are AI-controlled monsters who fight alongside you as a fifth party member. There are seven in all, each aligned to a different element, and you have to find them all, which is a pretty fun side quest. For the most part, they're very helpful, and there's no reason not to use them, unlike in Lufia 4, but they can be annoying in a few respects. First of all, in order to get more powerful, they need to evolve, which they can only do by feeding them the proper equipment. The only problem with this is that the game is bugged. Monsters will crave certain items, but when you feed them those items, it's really a crapshoot on whether they're actually going to like it or not. It's very frustrating to find a rare item, see the monster craving it, feed it to him, only for him to say it's disgusting and need nothing for it, and to top it all off, you lose the item. Secondly, many of the monsters are found far too late in the game to be viable, considering that they all start on level 1. I pretty much use Fumi, who's the neutral monster that you find first for the entire game, and the light monster who can heal for special circumstances, such as the Ancient Cave. Speaking of the Ancient Cave, it's no longer a dark, dank, swamp-infested shithole like it was in the first game, but instead it's a joy to behold and very fun to play. When you enter, you're stripped of all your levels, items, spells, and equipment. You're then gold with the task of reaching the 100th floor in one go. This is similar to a roguelike, and it's quite the daunting task. It's not impossible, though, and I've done it, though it does take quite some time. Interspersed throughout the cave are red chests, which are items that you can keep only in the dungeon, blue chests, which is special equipment only found in the ancient cave, and you can take it with you after you leave the dungeon, and iris treasures, which are kind of like trophies. They're really just there for decoration and completion's sake. The only way to leave the cave other than dying is to complete it fully or find and use the Providence item, which is found around the 20th floor. Towards the end of the cave, some unique monsters will start to appear, such as dragons, but the ultimate boss, harder than the final boss of the game, is Master, a giant red slime, which is the weakest enemy in the game. Anyway, if you manage to defeat Master in four turns or just suicide yourself, you gain the ancient key and an iris treasure. The key just allows you to open a door in Grubrick Lobby, so it's pretty much useless and only there for bragging rights. There are a few changes to the American version of the game. All the crosses were removed, bunny girls in the casino were removed as well, and a puzzle in Gordovin Tower was completely removed because it involved moving blocks into the shape of a horror of horrors cross. Also, the flo a floor in the treasure sword shrine was completely glitched and it's very difficult to navigate, though this was fixed in the European version. Upon completing the game, there is a New Game Plus feature where you go through the game earning four times more experience, 
fully eliminating the need for grinding, and if you complete the game again, you open up a gift mode, which allows you to just play the ancient cave, but you're able to choose which party members to bring into the cave with you, including what would be the best party, which would be Maxim, Guy, Dakar, and Artea. I love Lufia 2. It's easily in my top 5 best NES games, and it's easily the best Lufia game as well. It's just a crying shame that the sequels didn't build off of Lufia 2's accomplishments and instead tried in vain to do their own thing, but that's another video for another day. This has been David with Lufia 2 A History. If you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and have a good day!